The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. Welcome to everyone watching live on YouTube, including everyone from the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page, and the I Love It When I Wake Up in the Morning and Barack Obama is President Facebook page. Here's something I think you're going to like. I'm going to go and tell you about how Fox News distorts statistics using graphs. This is a really great post over at simplystatistics.org where we've individually covered almost every single one of these, Lewis, over time, but they've really put them together to show us how Fox News really distorts and use, uses statistics, okay? Let's put up number one, Natan, uh, the federal welfare received in the U.S. graph. Now, this is a classic Fox News tactic where if they want to make it appear as though there's been a dramatic increase somewhere, typically somewhere that makes uh, President Obama look bad or a Democrat look bad. What they'll do is they'll truncate the y-axis. So if you look at this, it looks like we have a dramatic increase, Lewis, over time. But when you actually look at the label on the left side of the graph, you see that this doesn't start at zero. This is a graph that only encompasses 94 million to 108 million. So we're really talking about a tiny little increase here, but when you completely mess with the proportions and the, and the perspective, it looks like, look at that, federal welfare is blown up. Right. I'm surprised they didn't uh, take it a few steps further and just eliminate the 108 in the and the 94. Get know. rid of the numbers altogether. Right. Right. So let's look at the other one where they do this. This is the second graph. This is if the Bush tax cuts expire. And this is a similar tactic that was done here where they actually, uh, I hope we have the right one up, Natan. Um, yeah, where, it's, actually, it's actually not coming up. So not all of them are going to come up. Okay. So can we put it up full screen or what, what do we have going on? Yeah, I'll put it up full screen. Okay, so we have the if the Bush tax cuts expire up full screen. This is the exact same thing. This time the y-axis is labeled on the right side, and you see that, wow, look at that huge increase in the top tax rate if the Bush tax cuts expire. It's like five times as big, Lewis. Oh, well, actually, the entire chart only goes from 34 to 42. So there's one. Another tactic that they do, I believe this is number three, Natan, is what if the numbers just don't add up? I don't know if this one is intentional or not, but it happens all the time on Fox News. And it's where they put up a poll where the numbers just don't add up to 100%. Now, sometimes this can be because people are asked to check all that apply, which, of course, makes these percentages far less valuable in even evaluating the information. Uh, there's a number of other reasons why it can happen, but certainly it can be to make it seem like there is an overwhelming or underwhelming support for something that Fox wants to point out. So here's an example. Did scientists fal uh, falsify research to support their own theories on global warming? 59% say it's somewhat likely. 35% say it's very likely. 26% say it's not very likely. Just doesn't add up. Doesn't make any sense, Lewis. Uh, another example of that, if we go to the pie chart, Natan, this is who do people back in the 2012 presidential run Republican candidates. And as you can see, 63% back Huckabee, 70% back Palin, 60% back Romney. Completely misleading in the sense that you're basically polling to say, would you back this person? And obviously people can support more than one. The idea that any of these candidates have this level of support is just false, misleading, just, just flat out misleading, Lewis. Right. Not as bad as the other ones because you're talking about three Republican candidates. Um, but yeah. I mean, it's, it's still misleading. No question about it. Let's go to another example which Fox likes to do, which is changing the units of comparison. So here's a graph, and you really have to look at this carefully to find the lie. When two things are likely to be very similar, one approach is to just present the numbers in different units. So here's an example where total spending for 2010 to 2013 is compared to deficits in 2008, okay? This is kind of an example of not labeling the axes. So you see numbers, uh, 2008, 3.2% was spending as a share of GDP. In 2009, 10.1% spending as the share of GDP. And then you see from 2010 to 2013, you're seeing an average number and comparing those back to 43, 44, and 1945. It's just confusing. It's just confusing, and it's, it, it's either deliberate or it's stupidity. And in either case, you shouldn't be trusting this stuff. I think in most cases, this is deliberate. You think so? Yeah. Let's go to the next example. This is the unemployment rate. So this is a classic. This is changing the magnitude of the units at different X values. So if you look at this chart of the unemployment rate under President Obama, 
you see that the changes in magnitude at the high x values are higher than the changes in magnitude at the lower x values. This is actually just a technique for, for pushing viewers in one direction. Look, Lewis, at the end of it. See how there's the last two figures are 9.0 and 8.6? That's a difference of 0.4. The, 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 the graphical representation is almost identical. However, if you look at the beginning, look at the change from 8.8 .8 to 9.0. It's only a change in 0.2. Yet there's a huge dip. Yet there's a huge increase, exactly, in the graphic of it. Downright misleading, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Natan, what's the next graph so I make sure that we're going to the right one? Um, the thing is, the next graph, the last one isn't working. The last one's not working. Job so loss by quarter. Job loss by quarter is the one I want to be looking at. Can we put it up full screen, Natan? Yes. Okay, so here is another one. This is changing trends by subsampling x values. So here's a graph that shows unemployment rates over time. And here is, uh, and as you can see here, you've got December of 07 to September of 08 to March of 09 to June of 2010. So we're basically literally just, this is literally cherry picking. You're just picking four bullet points and putting them up there. And then notice that at the top it says job loss by quarter. And at the bottom, you see between the first two plot points, uh, that's, a, that's like nine months. And then between the second two plot points, uh, it's only six months, seven months. Like, what's going on? The, the graphs just literally make no sense. Yeah, completely there just to, to give people the wrong idea about the facts. Yeah. So again, if, if you uh, are aware of these tactics, hopefully they will be less effective on distorting information for you. Uh, let's move on to Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck's latest stunt is he put an effigy of President Obama in, quote, urine. Now, I need to use that quote because otherwise this entire discussion would be indecent and it wouldn't be, you know, you have to, he put it in, quote, urine, unquote. And uh, he made what he's calling an Obama in PP art piece. So I guess the idea here was to show that there was some kind of double standard between what is considered art if it criticizes the left or if it uh, 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 is actually supporting the left, so on and so forth. So this is Glenn Beck's stunt where he kind of, he does like a French accent and he does this nonsense. Let's take a look at a little bit of it, Lewis. And here it is. Ah, yes. Look. Beautiful, huh? Oh, sure, it is not my blue period. It is my... Yellow period. No Picasso, no Michelangelo, huh? but... Uh... Okay, so the idea is he's doing a French accent because I guess if you're French, you're a liberal artist and that's supposedly representing Glenn Beck's urine and then he dips an Obama effigy into it. Okay, do you want to see that, Lewis, and what that looks like? Uh, not really, but for the sake of uh, the I show... I think what anything we need to show, here he is, he takes the Obama effigy and puts it kind. in. Kind of like this, you know? Crown of thorns, here he is. This is when an icon and art come together. So he takes the Obama effigy. Kids do not try this at all. And he dips it in his urine. And then the French music, I guess something representing French music comes on. So this is Glenn Beck. Uh, this is what he's doing. This was all, the, the hook was that there was an, a Boston artist who painted President Obama being crucified. And Glenn Beck said, listen, I don't like the painting, but I want to support the artist's right to do it. So then he came up with his Obama in PP art piece. And then he said he would sell it on his website. He ended up putting it on eBay. eBay removed it because they considered it offensive material. And Glenn Beck is saying that there is a, a double standard. I'll be honest, I don't care at all about the stunt. I don't find it offensive. I don't care about the fake urine. I don't care about the dipping the Obama effigy in it. I think Glenn Beck is just running out of stuff to do, and it's really sad. Right. Uh, this is, in the grand scheme of things, not very offensive compared to what we've seen some people do with um, with chairs hanging from their trees and <laughs> you know things of that sort. Right. So it's really just sad. And it it's, is. It's, it's, it's stupid. I mean, it, Glenn Beck is stooping to this. I mean, anyone who watches and takes this seriously has to evaluate their lives. You, you, this, is, this is pretty bad stuff. Yeah, yeah this is, we're, we're reaching new lows here. Robert Gleason Jr. is opting for the electric chair for the first time since 2010. Robert Gleason Jr. is a Virginia prisoner 
who strangled two inmates in prison. And he's promised, basically, he said, I'm going to keep killing unless you give me the electric chair on January 16th, 2013. He's killed a total of three people now. He has waived all state and federal appeals. He would be the first prisoner to die in the electric chair since 2010. Now, he told the Associated Press, I did the crime and this is the punishment. It is what it is. I ain't going to go kill a bunch of people and say, oh, don't do that to me. Inmates in Virginia have a choice between electrocution or lethal injection. Certainly, as we know, most choose lethal injection, Lewis. He was serving a life term for murder and he killed his cellmate. The way he did it was he was actually, uh, I guess they were locked in individual cages. Even though they were cellmates, they were in different cages. And Gleason convinced his cellmate to, I guess he needed to test the length on a necklace that he was making. So through the cage, he put it around his cellmate and then just strangled him. And I guess it took about an hour because as you can imagine, you can't get that much leverage through the cage that they were in. I don't know. Incredibly gruesome. And he's basically just saying, I murdered a man cold-bloodedly. I planned it. I'm going to do it again. It needs to be stopped. Put me on death row. Give me the electric chair. And he's repeated these threats in court. What do you think? I think, isn't there a way to put him in complete isolation? Um, if he's going to get the death sentence anyway, is, then okay. My understanding is now he actually has been moved into 23-hour isolation. All right. Well, I don't know what to say about it. Is I mean, this it, a case, even though you're against the death penalty, are you for it in this case? You know, people always say... Anybody who's against the death penalty, we can find a situation where they'd be for it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm still not for it in this case. If he gets sentenced to death because of these extra killings, fine. Put him to death. Okay. Give him the chair. Um, if not, the prison needs to make sure that he cannot do this again. What do you think, Natan? Even in cases where... Now, the, the idea that he's asking for the death penalty doesn't mean anything because anybody no, who does. What's that? I think it's all about that. This is a guy who's asking for the death penalty. Clearly, the best way of punishing him for that is not to give it to him. Oh, so you think that the fact that he's asking for it is actually a reason not to give it to him? Absolutely. Isn't the worst punishment? If he wants to die, for him not to die is the perfect punishment. I mean, don't you think? It's, a, it's an interesting point. I agree with Natan, yeah. And that's why I think unless he's legally sentenced to death, he should be in a place where he cannot do this to anyone, don't give him the opportunity. All right. Keep him in a cell, uh, if it's legal, 24 hours a day. Speaking of killers and shooters, the Batman shooter now is being accused of saying that his therapist brainwashed him to commit that crime in uh, the Aurora, Colorado movie theater. This is kind of a controversial, weird thing, and we need to kind of evaluate the, the information here. There was a drug abusing inmate who spent some time near James Holmes in a cell, okay? His name is Stephen Unruh, and he spoke with the Denver Westward and said that he had a four hour conversation with James Holmes in jail on July 20th after he was brought in for allegedly killing the 12 people and shooting 58 others. Now, they were in different cells, but Unra says that he heard Holmes slamming himself into the wall and that by yelling, he was able to have this conversation with Holmes. And he alleges that Holmes said, my therapist brainwashed me and programmed me to execute this killing. Also saying that Holmes said, I felt like I was in a video game when he was carrying out these attacks of shooting uh, uh, all of these people in the movie theater. Now, it doesn't appear that this is necessarily reliable testimony from Mr. Unruh because police indicate that the layout would not allow for this four-hour conversation to even take place, the layout of the prison or the jail where they were being held. Um, so, so we have some question here. And I have to say, a story told to us by a drug addict criminal reporting what a psychotic individual told him may not be that reliable. I mean, do, do we really need uh, an investigation to figure that out? If... Uh... If, if it were me making a decision as to whether to throw this out or not, it would be thrown out. Certainly, I don't believe that there's anybody suggesting that this is going to be testimony of any kind, right. but it's just being discussed. So uh, that, that's what we're hearing. Now, let's just evaluate it at face value for a second. Do, do any of us believe the idea that it, it would even be possible for a therapist to program this man to kill? Maybe that's not the right word. I mean, certainly people have influence over others, but how do you even react to a claim like that? Just sounds completely absurd. Natan, what do you think? 
I don't know, the Manchurian candidate. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's really possible. Certainly uh, someone who's uh, mentally unwell is probably more susceptible to uh, suggestions like something like this if it happened. But I, I don't know if I really buy it. Right. Well, I mean, we do know that you can program someone to kill. It usually starts with getting them at a very young age, and then they end up with a bomb strapped to themselves at, uh, at a bazaar in, uh, in Kabul. Um, and then boom. So it can happen, but this this doesn't sound like unlikely that. that a therapist who just saw him a few times in college would be able to program him that way. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Listen, today we're doing a bonus show. I know that we may not mention this often. Some people might not know Lewis that we have a bonus show, but there is a bonus show. Lewis hosts it, and uh, we discuss a bunch of great stuff on it. Today we'll talk about some email chaos going on at NYU. We'll talk about uh, newly confirmed effects of chemotherapy on the brain. And we'll also talk about some death sentences over that Muslim film. We'll talk about that plenty more. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. As the holiday shopping season gets going, please remember if you do uh, any Amazon.com buying, whether it's uh, in the US, UK, or anywhere in Europe, remember to use the black banner at davidpakman.com. You click it, it's on the right side. No matter what country you're in, it will automatically redirect you back to your country's Amazon website, and 7% of your purchase will go to the David Pakman Show. That's, that's a big time thing, Lewis. Big time. We're big time. The membership program, also made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Liberalbias.com is celebrating its first birthday on December 1st, a whole year of exposing how numbers, facts, and reality have a liberal bias. Check it out at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Tim Napier. Tim Napier is a new David Pakman Show member, and like all David Pakman Show members, it's absolutely fantastic to have him aboard. Let's talk about country music. Do you like country music, Lewis? It's the only type of music I completely despise. Right. I don't like country music either. And this is a story not so much about country music per se, but about Trace Adkins, who is a country music, I guess he's called the country music star. I don't know. Uh, who wore, he uh, performed a song for the NBC Christmas special, and he wore a Confederate flag earpiece cover. Okay. Now, Trace Adkins is a guy who is known for being conservative. He is also uh, part of, according to IMDb, he's, he's part of the Louisiana Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. He's a big fan of the Confederacy, apparently. And he has also said that uh, when he joined con uh, a movement to help preserve Civil War battlefields, he said um, that they serve as monuments to what can happen when political wisdom fails and our differences are allowed to escalate beyond reason. So this is this is a little bit of the clip here. Now I'm surprised, given his background, that they had him sing Chestnuts Roasting or whatever it is instead of White Christmas. You would think White Christmas might be a more appropriate song for Trace Adkins. Needless to say, oh, he is, also appears to be wearing fur. So he's really trying to cover the entire gamut of who he can offend by uh, with this performance. Take a listen. Dressed up like Eskimos, everybody knows. A turkey and some mistletoe will help to make the season. Okay, I, I really find that unbearable. I mean, I can't even explain to you. Now, I'm going to reveal something. I actually have been to a concert where Trace Adkins performed. Once I was dragged to a concert near Chicago, a country music concert near Chicago. And Trace Adkins performed, and they brought out, like during his performance, they brought out, I, I'm not going to say he did it, but right before he went on stage, they brought out cannons, like old cannons <laughs> from, <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, from I don't know what war. And they had him there. I think at one point they might have been fired. And then tons of people uh, wearing, basically, like if you imagine taking a Confederate flag and turning it into a, a, a costume, that's what people were wearing. They were really cheering for this guy, and they just loved it. And it was it completely Sounds shocking. like hell, David. It was hell. So uh, now Natan was making a point beforehand, which is, Natan, you don't necessarily think that all of these Confederate flag fans are racist. 
No, uh, I'm not, I don't. I can't speak to Trace Adkins' personal beliefs and whether he's a racist or not. Or, but I do think that a lot of the people in the South that wear um, Confederate imagery and things like this are not necessarily racist at all. They just really don't understand what the Civil War was really about. Right. That it was about slavery, and they think that um, it's somehow a, a non-racist, non-slavery related symbol of Southern pride. Um, and I really think a lot of them actually believe that. Now, that doesn't mean that I condone uh, ignorance on that front, but I don't think that necessarily all these guys are, are racists or think that the Confederacy should have kept slavery up until the present day. Lewis, imagine if they had been allowed to secede. We would at this point probably have a total third world dystopia, the likes of which you find in science fiction right next door. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it almost certainly would have led to either... A, uh, a civil war eventually or um, them having to join the northern states just because of uh, financially economically right it, it would they'd have no choice porn star Nina Hartley punked anti-gay anti-choice anti-everything pastor John Hagee and said I considered flashing my boobs to be honest this is really funny uh, Nina Hartley who has appeared in dozens of adult films came face to face with conservative pastor uh, uh, Hagee and this happened this is this is so funny she was writing an article she wrote an article about this for Hustler Larry Flynn's Hustler Hustler has articles in it apparently oh. and the article was leaked to Ross Story and Ross Story had, had it and it says John Hagee meets with the great whore of Babylon and it talks about how Hagee came to Beverly Hills a couple of months ago and she showed up and basically just showed up there and asked him to, to sign uh, her book and considered flashing her, she said, I considered flashing my boobs, but decided not to. And, you know, her article actually really seems pretty good. She says, as a Jew, I've long found it annoying that evangelicals are so hell-bent on getting all the Jews to return to Israel, not for our own good, mind you, but to bring about Armageddon and the second coming. With ideas like that, it's not hard to imagine what Pastor Hagee would think of my job and what that makes me in his eyes. Reportedly, Hagee said to her, there are a lot of crazies in Los Angeles, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> she showed up, as we see in this picture here, dressed in this conservative red blazer. He probably had no idea who she was. She thinks that other people in the room knew who she was, but everybody, of course, no one wants to admit to knowing because it's a conservative crowd, so nobody says anything, and the porn star gets her book signed by, by Hagee. Yeah, this is in actually incredibly well written. I, I got to read this other sentence here. Yeah. Porn hounds know no party or religious affiliation. But if any of the attendees recognized me, they kept mum about it in this setting. The ability to compartmentalize seems to be the hallmark of ideologues <laughs> everywhere. I guess it spares them the potentially lethal attacks of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> right. So I actually am looking forward to reading the entire thing. Yeah, you'll have uh, to get the hustler. So there it is. It's the, uh, well, it's, I think it's online yeah, now I, already. Uh, the the uh, height of parody there, for sure. Mm -hmm. An anti-Semitic storm is taking place in the English soccer world. Now, Natan, why don't you give us the background on this? Because you are intimately familiar with it since you've been following it. Well, uh, there's a team from London, one of the five English Premier League teams called Tottenham from the Tottenham neighborhood. And uh, for a variety of reasons for the past 80 or so years, they've been associated with like Yiddish slash Jewish imagery, um, basically because there were a lot of Hasidic Jews around the stadium where the team played, so they got associated with that. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism from competing teams throughout England when they played in their stadiums. And right. as a result, a lot of those fans from Tottenham sort of appropriated the Jewish and Yiddish label, and they call themselves the Yid Army and Yiddos and so on and so forth. Right. So that's kind of the, that's, that's the bottom line. Now, lately, this has been ramping up because of activity going on in the international news world with Israel and Gaza and Hamas. The anti-Semitism has been ramping up, Lewis. And, you know, I, whenever I see a story like this, as Natan says, appropriating oneself of these anti-Semitic terms, uh, when, when black people appropriate themselves of the N-word in order to try to diffuse it or take away its meaning, I'm not convinced that it's that great of a strategy. Yeah, I I don't really know what to make of this. Um, of course, they're not calling themselves uh, the Kike Army. No. You know, it's it's certainly not uh, not the most offensive word they could have chosen. So this has included everything from Nazi salutes to hissing, mimicking the sound of gas chambers, 
and a number of other things that are, that are incredibly uh, uh, low, reprehensible, and despicable. So, Natan, is there any sense of, like, is the, is, do we need a solution? I don't even know what can happen here. You can't really control what people in a crowd do. No, the uh, stadium, or, or I should say the teams um, where this has happened, in whose stadiums this has happened, have banned some of these fans when they can identify them. There was one fam, fan at uh, the West Ham Stadium where this happened recently that was a season ticket holder, a lifelong fan. He was banned for life the other day. So I think this is good. I think the other thing that needs to happen is referees need to not be afraid to call this out when it happens and stop a game. They can actually stop games from happening, uh, from continuing when this happens. And if that has, starts to happen, I think fans will soon change their behavior. Self-policing will immediately start. Let's see some action on behalf of the players, too. I mean, if, if you're playing on a team and your fans are acting like this, I do something about it. Well, there has been some example of that, right, Natan? Yeah, and actually, um, I mean, th there's a lot going on here trying to figure out how to stop this. Some people think that it's the Tottenham fans' fault for uh, continuing this imagery, as you were saying before. I disagree with that for a number of different reasons. I don't think that's an excuse for what's going on here. But certainly something needs to be done. I just want to point out that this is also happening in Rome recently, when Tottenham went to play at uh, the Olympic Stadium in Rome. And it's happening in other countries. And the picture that we have up, if you can see the picture behind Dave and Lewis, is actually the Ajax or Ajax team from uh, Amsterdam, I think. And they have this similar sort of Yiddish Jewish imagery going on there with the Israeli flag. So this is not just a, an English or a London thing. No, it's more widespread than that. All right, let's take a break. Please join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. We'll take a break. We'll follow up. Next, I want to talk about What's going on with the Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi? Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. Joining me today on Worldview with Dennis Campbell is Dennis Campbell, editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine. The book is Egypt Unshackled. That's also the topic today. Dennis, let's start with Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi's uh, extrajudicial declaration that he made, which made some headlines, and then we'll delve deeper into what's happening in Egypt. Uh, what, what was that declaration exactly? Well, basically, the, the declaration is one in which he said that uh, no other governing body, most uh, especially the judiciary itself, which if you remember going back a few months are the people that dissolved parliament and attempted to say basically you have to start all over again despite all the progress that had been made. They'd had parliamentary elections, they had seated a parliament, they'd had a presidential election and basically the only thing that, that the uh, judiciary was saying could stand was the presidential election and, and he basically is saying I want to make certain that nothing that I do can be stopped by this judicial body in any form. I'm taking power and what a lot of people have assumed that to mean is that he's become the next Hosni Mubarak. He has become uh, the, the dictator of the new Egyptian government and I don't think that's exactly true. Okay, so let's let's go the, down that uh, route. Thomas Friedman had an interesting article earlier in the week where he said the question now is, will President Morsi be a diplomat or will he be a dictator? Certainly, he's framing it, particularly in giving himself credit for the ceasefire in Israel between Israel and Hamas as being a more diplomatic character, although that is not a statement that's without controversy. So what are going to be the key things to look at in the next, I don't know, month, six months, year, to determine what direction is this going to go? Well, you're going to be looking at a number of different factors. I mean, the, from what I understand, what's happening right now as we are filming this and will be going on this evening is that they are rushing a draft of the Constitution through the parliamentary body and through this constitutional body to then make certain that it goes out for ratification. However, some of the commentary I've seen says that because the document is a little bit more strident than people had expected, a little bit more authoritarian, that this first pass 
is likely to fail so that it comes he, he he gets to come back to the table looking very very diplomatic after it fails at in election the constitution and then is in a position to come up with a new constitution essentially so he's in a bit of an interesting spot because Egypt on the one hand is the second biggest uh, uh uh, benefactor of American aid money behind Israel. And at the same time, uh, Morsi has taken, at least when it came a couple of weeks ago, between Israel and Hamas, a very anti-Israeli position. So he has to know that there's a, there's a, there's not, maybe it's not a fine line, maybe it's a bit of a blurry line, but there is a line as far as how far he can go before that aid starts to, to become a question mark, doesn't it? Exactly. And, you know, I think when I, you know, I've read today that uh, uh, our good friend in Texas, uh, the, the man not playing with a completely full deck, Louis Gomert, came out and, and, and said, I don't know whether it was on the floor, I think it was on a radio station that, uh, you know, President Obama has been uh, teaming up with the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and you know, it, it's just strange to see the reaction the minute you have the Muslim Brotherhood come up as a, as a potential party to these talks. What a lot of people don't understand is that the Muslim Brotherhood is probably the, the, the most moderate of all the potential options that were out there. <laughs> and the fact is, is that Morsi's a pretty smart guy. He's going to allow this process to go through and he's going to do what he can to keep you know, Hamas happy because obviously they are a part of, of Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, on the very extreme sides of it in the, in the West Bank and, and Gaza, but he's not going to do anything to upset the apple cart in what's been essentially a 35-year peace in the region. Do you think that he's going to be put in a position to directly have to address these reports that we're getting, satellite reports, that uh, there is a refueling, so to speak, of Hamas taking place from Iran and that the, the path for that is going via the Red Sea, Sudan, and ultimately Egypt, which also shares a border with Gaza. Is that going to become a factor for Morsi's credibility at some point? Is he trying to simply make that just not even come up? What's his position? I, don't, I really think he's got enough problems. He's got 80 million people inside the most populous you know, Muslim nation in the, well, actually, they're, they're really more secular, but there is a very large percentage of Muslim and Islamic uh, people inside of Egypt itself. I think he's got enough just to keep himself in power and moving forward from there. The one party that we've not talked about in all this is the SCAF, the Su Supreme Council of the, Al of the Armed Forces. And that is the, the ultimate decider. At the end of the day, if they're unhappy with what happens, they control the guns, they control the army, and if they decide that you know this is unacceptable, more she's gone. So he's got to keep a lot of balls in the air and a lot of people happy and show that he's you know the moderate leader that everybody expects him to be. Yes, the new constitution has a lot of, uh, of uh, what sends the right off into a tizzy, uh, is found in Sharia law, but it is not as extreme as what you see in Iran or other parts of the, of the uh, Muslim world. So I don't see uh, you know, a, a huge change, but I do think that there are going to be fits and starts. It took the United States 11 years from the uh, Declaration of Independence to actually have a constitution. It's going to take a considerable amount of time before this gets itself settled, and it's only been 20 months. All right, so De Dennis Campbell, Worldview with Dennis Campbell, the last day of November. You'll see Dennis <laughs> clean-shaven next week. And uh, what will be our topic of discussion for next week, Dennis? You know, we've, we've got some breaking news here in the United Kingdom with the release of the Levinson Press Report. Um, that is causing huge uh, 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 tremors over here. We've got, uh, obviously, the, the committee has come out and, and, and damned rightfully so uh, both Rupert and James Murdoch for their oversight of News International. And uh, they're talking about putting in a regulatory body that will oversee the press. Now, this is a state body. Uh, Cameron has said it's dead on arrival in terms of the, the, the regulatory body. But there's lots of implications here. And there's lots of implications there. Because if Murdoch is found by Parliament to have not run News International very well, and if we see some phone hacking convictions come out as a result of what has happened, you're going to find yourself with the, the headless SEC now uh, having to dive into this. Because once one of these phone hacking cases results in a conviction, you're going to be in a position where you're going to be putting under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act the licenses of Fox News and all of the holdings in the United States right. at risk. So it's going to be big.
All right, that, that'll be for next week. We've been speaking, of course, with Dennis Campbell. He's editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine. Check out the book Egypt Unshackled and the latest book, Billionaire Boys Election Freak Show. Dennis, we'll talk to you next week. We'll see you then. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Our program is mostly funded by individual memberships. Please consider getting a membership on our website, davidpakman.com slash membership. Well, we have now heard that there have been two lottery winners in the record Powerball jackpot, which was $579.9 million. One of these was so, uh, sold in the Kansas City area. I forget the name of the um, uh, uh, location in Missouri where it actually was sold. The person has not yet come forward. Another one was sold in Arizona. So basically, they're going to split the 587, uh, 550, I don't I can't get a clear number. It's either 579.9 or 587.5, something like that. It's a lot of money. That's what's clear. Yeah, I mean, not much of a difference there. The numbers were 516, 22, 23, 29, and the Powerball was six, Lewis, in case you were wondering. Uh, no numbers that I would have picked. So this, I, I'm fascinated by lottery winners because number one, we know that uh, socioeconomically, most lottery tickets, an overwhelming number of lottery participants are people who uh, are not well off financially, right? So there's this idea of, uh, of, of hitting it big and making it into, making it into the 1%. In other words, the 99% spend a lot of money trying to make it into the 1% by winning the lottery. But that being said, my graduate research paper was actually on the money happiness correlation. And it's always interesting because you, you hear about so many lottery winners who end up, number one, if they're lucky enough not to end up broke because they overspent, um, they really end up with all sorts of personal problems and they're not any happier than they, thought, than they were before winning, even though they thought they would be. And in my research, now this is four-year-old data at this point, we might have to adjust these numbers, but happiness correlated positively with... Uh, income up until the point, and this is across all countries, where your buying power reached about 10,000 US dollars four years ago, so in 2008. Beyond that, you really don't get any happier when you're able to buy more stuff when your income is more than uh, about $10,000 worth of buying power in US 2008 dollars. Surprising numbers? Because that's, that's little, pretty low. A little surprising. I, I think, uh, I think, there'd be a little bit more in terms my of initial power, my guess would have been it was more like 30,000 right that's what i would have guessed yeah around but, there but certainly uh it doesn't matter whether you make a hundred thousand a year or a million a year or whether you're in the top 0.1 percent uh there does not seem to be any correlation between money and happiness that goes beyond basically subsistence level mm -hmm. How, there are also many examples which i found which escape me now of, of many countries with very low standards of living where people are actually very, very happy, which really just furthers this idea that even though individually it seems counterproductive when you think about it broadly, yeah, there's factors that go way beyond money that contribute to happiness. I'm sure there are exceptions. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who, uh, who are completely dependent on money to be happy. Well, in, in relation to these Powerball winners, Carl Rove was just on Fox News saying he has someone on the ground in Missouri. He says it's a little bit too early to call this thing. He doesn't know. We, we don't yet know who won. He wants the numbers double checked. We're going to take care. You know, Fox may have been a little premature in calling this thing for these two people. Yep. And they're going to have a, a reread of the numbers to make <laughs> <Right>. sure. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to do that. Hey, this is a really interesting science story. Scientists have developed a 3D tissue printer, which can print cartilage. Now, you've heard about 3D printers, Lewis, which can basically yes. layer by layer make a gear or other me me mechanical devices, yeah. all sorts of different stuff. Right. Well, here's a, a, a 3D printer, which is a hybrid printer, which can print cartilage, which one day could then be implanted into injured patients to help regrow cartilage, uh, particularly in joints, knees, elbows, so on and so forth. And it was featured in a study in, uh, that was published in the journal called Biofabrication by the Institute of Physics. And it's a, a hybrid between an inkjet printer and an electro-spinning machine. This is pretty remarkable, isn't it, Lewis? This is, this is amazing, yeah. 
And uh, the study showed that the printer was able to print cartilage better than the ones that were created by an inkjet printer, which kind of makes sense because you wouldn't think inkjet printers are too good at printing cartilage. But that's a whole other story, which I don't think we have time for today. Mm, right. Yeah. So in the future, the idea is that you could actually print cartilage custom made for specific patient needs. You could do an MRI, for example, of the knee, and then that provides a blueprint, and then you create perfectly matching cartilage with one of these printers from the ground up. It's incredible. Yep. This is, uh, I like this. I put my stamp of approval on this technology. The next step is a printer that can actually print out your Thanksgiving meal. That would make things easy, <laughs> but who knows? That might be a really expensive printer. This is almost like the, like a matter. You, I, I don't remember what book it is. I think it, it actually may be. I don't know if this was in a Scanner Darkly by Philip K. Dick or what science fiction book actually has. You actually make your food by just you put in the different uh, uh, elements essentially that go into food, and and the the machine can basically organize matter in a way that comes out like the food you're used to eating. Right, like in uh, Star Trek. Is that, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, there's something similar there. All right, so that's that. Incredible stuff. You approve of, the, of that one? I approve. All right. Let's get to some voicemails. You can leave us voicemail 24 hours a day. The phone number is 219-2-DAVID-P. Here's a voicemail from the Eggman checking in about a whole bunch of stuff, including pri prison price gouging. Hi, guys. About Angus T. Jones, some of his comments about Satan and stuff, I think he was referring to Chuck L Oh, anywhere you want. Anywhere, I don't know, it ain't mine. Yeah, I mean, Eggman's very busy I during these calls. Chuck Lore is Satan, you know, the guy that produces it, who friggin' uh, Charlie Sheen called Jaime Lore, you know, which was his like, real Jewish name. But anyway, um, this anti-Semitism in the uh, Pathfinder or whatever, Angus T. Jones. Also, phone service in federal prison is so expensive for a 15-minute phone call that when I would get a couple hundred bucks on my books, I would half of it would go for my phone and half would go for weed. And sometimes I couldn't even get weed because my phone calls cost me so much money. That's yeah. incredible. When the Eggman was in prison, sometimes the phone calls were so expensive, he wasn't even able to use his prison-earned income to buy marijuana. That's, that's interesting. Man. All right, let's Rough keep listening. Times. Like, choose one between the other one. And I also do not believe that any Democrats can go to heaven or Republicans or anybody because this bullshit idea doesn't even exist. And a 400-pound woman was coming home from Hungary, and they went on a plane. Is that a joke that she was 420 pounds, that she's in the country of Hungary, and no one is making any hungry jokes? I don't get it. Oh, yeah, Jeremy from Japan is a good caller. I was not being facetious at all. I like what he says, content-wise and caller-wise. That's it, guys. Shalom. Have a good day. All right, so the Eggman getting a bunch of stuff on the record Eggman, there. Eggman, I really had to bite my lip not to make a joke about the Hungary thing. I had to be politically correct. Uh... I just, who knows? I, I didn't want to insult anybody. And a lot of email pouring in about the next George Zimmerman, this Michael Dunn case in Florida. Well, what can you expect? This man clearly needed to protect himself from the loud music. So what if he used deadly force? The music was loud and the kids were black after all. Case closed. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially the discussion we were having yesterday. Right. Uh, another one here. If the music was loud... All he had to do was walk out of earshot. He was only waiting for his girlfriend to buy something. Surely he could have put up with it for a few minutes. It's a classic case of redneck racist intolerance coupled with easy access to firearms. Wow. A dangerous, dangerous combination. And cool. So if he wins the case, I can just walk. Can I just walk outside and start shooting people that play music loud? Would it be precedent? Would it be precedent that loud music is considered intimidatory and you need to stand your ground on that? Well, I think uh, I think his defense is going to be that he thought the kids were going to get out of the car and attack him or right. he thought they had guns themselves and were going to shoot him. It's just like how how far can you really take? I thought they had a gun. How far can you really take that? Not very far, hopefully. Hopefully not very far at all. Yeah, we have to see how this case goes. We're going to follow it uh, very closely. Yeah. We're going to have a great bonus show today. We're going to talk about the effects of chemotherapy on the brain. There's a fascinating new study out about it, and we're going to discuss it. We'll also talk about Egypt sentencing eight people to death over that innocence of, of Muhammad, innocence of Muslims. What was the name of the movie? Is, I think it's Innocence of Islam. Yeah, the, you know something. the movie, the one that didn't have anything to do with the Benghazi situation. Eight people sentenced to death over it and a lot more. So get the bonus show. Go to davidpackman.com slash membership. Sign up. We are now taking Amazon payments. If you don't like PayPal, you can just pay for it just like you would buy anything off of amazon.com. davidpackman.com slash membership. That's it, Lewis. That's all we got. I've got nothing else. We'll talk yeah. to you Monday afternoon.
The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.